Okay, we're going to talk about rotational equilibrium. Not so very long ago, we talked about translational equilibrium. And we said if something's moving at constant velocity or if it's at rest, then the vertical forces have to balance out and the horizontal forces have to balance out. So we've got a teeter-totter here. It's at rest. It must be in translational equilibrium. And horizontal force is not too interesting. Let's consider the vertical forces. Now, if it's in balance, the size of those down forces has to be just as big as the size of those up forces. So our down forces are the 500 newtons and the 250 newtons. Of course, they add up to 750 newtons. And that means our up force has to be 750 newtons. That's going to be that contact force of the fulcrum on the teeter-totter, 750 newtons. Now what we want to discuss is rotational equilibrium, and we're going to discuss it in exactly the same way. So our object, it's not moving, it's not translating, but it's also not rotating, and we've got to treat those separately. So let's consider the torques. If it's in rotational equilibrium, that means that our counterclockwise torques have to be the same size as our clockwise torques. Now, our teeter-totter isn't rotating, so we could choose anywhere as our axis of rotation. We could choose this as our axis of rotation, and we should still have this balancing of torques. Of course, it's a natural place to choose for our axis of rotation, and that's going to be right here at the fulcrum. So let's do that. The weight of the girl is exerting a force in the counterclockwise direction. So that torque would be 250 newtons times the lever arm distance, 3 meters, turns out to be 750 newton meters again. And the weight of the boy is exerting a force equal to 500 newtons times the lever arm distance, 1.5 meters, so that again we get torques balancing out just as much counterclockwise torque as clockwise torque. And notice it is just coincidental that we're getting 750 here and here. Don't read anything into the fact that we got 750 in those two cases. What's important is that the torque's balanced and the vertical force is balanced. Here's an IB question. Let's see if you understand the difference between rotational equilibrium and translational equilibrium. Pause the video, try the question, come back for the answer. So hopefully you first of all looked at the vertical forces. There are no horizontal forces. We just need to look at the vertical forces. And we've got an up force here of 2F. And of course that's equal to the down force of F plus F. So that means you are in translational equilibrium. That's true. Now what we want to do is look at the torques. Now we could choose any point for our axis of rotation. I could choose this point here as my axis of rotation but that would make the problem needlessly complex. I'm going to choose this point right here. If I do that, this force here exerts no torque because there is no lever arm distance. The force is straight through the axis of rotation. That also means that this force here is exerting a counterclockwise torque. And this force here is exerting also a counterclockwise torque, and we don't have any clockwise torques to balance. And that means you're not in translational equilibrium. You've got on the counterclockwise size F times D plus another 2F times D and on the clockwise torque side you've got no torque at all. So that means you're not in rotational equilibrium. And so the correct answer here is it's in translational equilibrium only. Another IB question you're asked in which situation are you in both translational equilibrium and rotational equilibrium. Pause the video, try the question, come back for the answer. So the correct answer is C. That's because if we look at the forces to the left and to the right, you've got F plus 2F to the right, and then 2F plus F, or 3F, to the left. So 3F equals 3F, that means you are in translational equilibrium. That's true. So now let's look at the torques so we can examine whether or not we're in rotational equilibrium. This force 2F, it exerts no torque 
as long as we choose our axis of rotation to be the center of the circle. F and 2F will result in a net force of F in this direction. If we call the radius of the circle here R, then the clockwise torque will be R times F, and that's going to equal the counterclockwise torque due to this force of R times F. So we're also in rotational equilibrium, and the correct answer is C. Here's a question from Paul Hewitt's Conceptual Physics. What I'd like you to do is to pause the video, read it over, try it out for yourself, come back for the answer. So there's two forces that act to make this beam rotate. One, of course, is the weight of the rock, which is going to be one kilogram times the acceleration due to gravity. And the other force is the weight of the beam. And in order to do that, we need to use a very important principle. And that principle is that the weight of an object acts through its center of mass. And of course, the center of mass of a beam is going to be right in the center of the beam. So our other force, which will equal the mass of this beam, times g, is going to rotate in the opposite direction. And if we're going to have a translational equilibrium, these two forces are going to have to be equal because they're both acting at the same lever arm distance. So 1 times g has to equal to m times g. So that means the mass of our beam, or the mass of our measuring stick in this case, has to be equal to 1 kilogram. Another IB question. Pause the video, try the question, come back for the answer. Let's start by drawing all the forces that are acting on our beam. The force that we're asked for is the tension here. And of course that tension force has to be directed straight along the rope. We've also got this 800 Newton force due to the weight that's hung on the beam. The beam itself has some weight, and that's going to be a force of 50 kilograms times 9.8 Newtons per kilogram, or 491 Newtons, directed through the middle of the beam, straight down. And then there'd be one other force, because we've got that pivot on the floor. Now, we're not asked for that force, but what's important here is to know that that force is going to be big enough so that you're going to get both translational and rotational equilibrium. Since we're not asked for that force, we'd kind of like to take it out of the picture. And so there's a little trick that we can use. Being as nothing's rotating, we can choose any point as our axis of rotation. And we're going to choose this point here, because that means that force F won't exert any torque. So now let's see if we can solve for that tension force by considering rotational equilibrium. So let's set up our equation for rotational equilibrium. That is that our counterclockwise torques should be the same size as our clockwise torques. Counterclockwise torque, well, the only force exerting a counterclockwise torque would be the tension itself. And if we say the length of the beam is L, then the lever arm distance for the tension will be L over 2. So the torque is going to be T times L over 2. Now both the 800 Newton and the 491 Newton force are going to exert clockwise torques. Now of course those torques would be given by the force times the lever arm distance times the sine of theta. And the angle we're talking about is always between the lever arm and the force. So we're talking about this angle here that's going to be in that equation. Now 53 degrees plus theta have to add up to 90 degrees and that means theta has to be 37 degrees. So let's put that in for both torques. We've got the 491 Newton force acting at a distance L over 2 again. And then we've got to multiply by the sine of 37 degrees. And let's do the same thing for the 800 Newton force acting with a lever arm distance equal to the full length of the beam, or L. And then once again, you've got to multiply by the sine of 37 degrees, because it's really only this component of the force that exerts any torque. So you do want to notice that you've got an L in every term, and that means you're going to divide by L, and the size of the tension won't depend on the length of the beam. I'll let you do the math. 
you should get the tension force equal to 1,258 newtons, which if you round to three significant digits would be 1,260 newtons. Therefore, your correct answer is A, 1,260 newtons. And a final IB question. Pause the video, try the question, come back for the answer. Now, of course, we're going to have to have rotational equilibrium and translational equilibrium. Let's look at the translational equilibrium first. So we're going to look at the horizontal translational equilibrium. The size of the forces to the left should be equal in size to the size of the forces to the right. Now, there's definitely a tension coming up here. And that means we're going to have a horizontal force here equal to that tension times the cosine of 40 degrees. That's my force to the left. Somewhere I've got to get a force to the right. The only place it can be is from this reaction force on the wall. And so there's got to be a component of that force. I'll call it Rx. Rx is going to have to be equal in size to T cos 40, so that left balances right. So first of all, I'm going to write Rx equal to T cos 40 degrees. And now it turns out that they actually tell us what the tension is. That means that Rx must be equal to 39 cos 40 degrees. Work that out, you should get 29.9 newtons. Now let's do the same thing for the vertical forces. Of course there's a vertical component of T here and that's going to be T times the sine of 40 degrees. We've got a downwards force of 50 newtons and we're going to have to have a little more lift from this reaction force. We're going to have to have an Ry here such that Ry and T sine 40 degrees are going to have to equal that downward force of 50 newtons. So our upward forces are going to be Ry plus this T sine 40 degrees. And that's going to balance our downward force of 50 newtons. That means we're going to be able to solve for Ry here. It's going to equal to 50 minus T, which is 39 newtons, times the sine of 40 degrees. Work that out and you get Ry equal to 24.9 newtons. And let's answer part A now. So we're asked to draw this reaction force R. Well, I've already drawn the two components, so this has to be R itself. So it's got to be pushing to the left and upwards. And now let's answer B. We need to get the magnitude and the direction of that force R. Right now we've just got the components. So our magnitude is, will equal the square root of Rx squared plus Ry squared, which would be 29.9 squared plus 24.9 squared. Work that out and you should get 39 newtons as the magnitude of that reaction force. We also need the angle. That's the angle here. That and that's going to equal the inverse tan of the y component divided by the x component. That'll be the 24.9 divided by the 29.9. Work that out and you should get 40 degrees. So our reaction force is 39 newtons directed 40 degrees above the horizontal to the right. And that's all for today, folks. Thank you very much.